tonight. Putin's plan. Putin seeks new security architecture for Asia and calls South Korea's weapon supply plan to Ukraine a big mistake. Trump's change. Trump promises automatic green cards for foreign graduates from the colleges in the state, which is a shift from his previous stance. Extreme weather. China hit by deadly flooding and extreme heat at the same time, with rain struggling landslides and farmers grappling with prolonged drought conditions. Emotional reunion. New Mexico wildfire forces don't want to leave it behind and reunites days later amid evacuation drama and heart-wrenching decisions. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Some key stories are coming up and we start off following the Russian leader's visit to Asia. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Vietnamese President Thu Lam signed multiple agreements on issues including energy, nuclear science and education, underlying Moscow's pivot to Asia after the West imposed sanctions over Ukraine. Following his initial visit to North Korea where he signed a mutual defense agreement, Putin is now on his second state visit in Asia. Vietnam rolled out the red carpet for Russian President Vladimir Putin on Thursday in the capital Hanoi. During the visit, now seen as a show of defiance to the West, Putin said he wants to build a, quote, reliable security architecture in the Asia-Pacific region. The two countries signed multiple agreements on issues including energy, although none of the 11 pacts were on the same level as the mutual defense agreement Russia signed with North Korea the day before. Vietnam's President To Lam said Vietnam will always consider Russia as one of its most important partners and that Putin had contributed to peace and stability in the world. Russia's TASS news agency quoted Putin as saying the two countries shared an interest in, quote, developing a reliable security architecture in the region. During a news conference, he accused the NATO military alliance of creating a security threat for Russia in Asia. We see what is happening in Asia. A bloc system is being put together. NATO is already moving there to Asia as if to a permanent place of residence, he said. The U.S. and its allies have criticized Putin's visit, saying he should not be given a stage on which to defend Russia's war in Ukraine. The Russian leader has an outstanding international criminal court warrant over alleged war crimes in Ukraine, which he denies. Neither Russia nor Vietnam are members of the court. The U.S. is Vietnam's top export market and upgraded diplomatic relations with the country last year. For its part, the U.S. State Department said a top diplomat will visit Vietnam this week to stress Washington's commitment to working with Hanoi. Russian President Vladimir Putin said yesterday that South Korea would be making a very big mistake if he decides to supply arms to Ukraine. He made a statement only a day after he inked a mutual defense pact with North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un. He also claimed Seoul has nothing to worry about concerning the new strategic partnership signed by Russia and North Korea on Wednesday. That pledges to provide immediate military assistance in the event the other is attacked. For more updates on this, let's join Adderna World News Special Correspondent reporting from Kursk in Russia. Minoli? Yes, Sanuri. Putin stated that their military assistance to the DPRK is contingent upon aggression being directed at one of the treaty's signatories. He noted that the Republic of Korea has no intentions of aggression towards the DPRK, implying that cooperation in this area should not raise concerns. Regarding South Korea's stance on providing arms to Ukraine, Director of the National Security of South Korea indicated a review of the issue while awaiting Russia's explanation following Putin's meeting with Kim Jong-un. South Korea currently adheres to the policy of not supplying lethal weapons to Ukraine. In response to queries on these remarks, Putin expressed his view, cautioning against supplying lethal weapons to Ukraine, deeming it a significant error. 
he conveyed a hope that such actions would not occur warning of potential corresponding decisions unlikely to be well received by south korea's current leadership back to you sanuvi thank you that was other than no world news special correspondent reporting from kars krashia Moving over to India, more than 40 people died and around 100 have been admitted to hospital as of yesterday after consuming illicit tainted liquor sold in the country's southern state of Tamil Nadu. According to a government spokesperson, since Wednesday, over 100 people have been suffering from stomach aches, diarrhea and vomiting and required medical treatment. Police arrested a 49-year-old man named as Govindaraj for producing and selling the illicit liquor, seizing some 200 litres of it. The Tamil Nadu state government has also suspended at least 10 officials, including the police chief and the district's collector. The illegally produced tainted alcohol is commonplace in India, where many cannot afford branded spirits. Last year, more than a dozen people died in a similar incident. China is being buffeted by two weather extremes, with heavy rain and flooding forcing the evacuation of tens of thousands of people in the south and a heat wave prompting fears of a drought for farmers in the north. The Chinese government has issued repeated calls to step up disaster prevention and preparedness in anticipation of more severe weather events because of climate change. Days of torrential rain have triggered severe flooding across eastern China, submerging villages and houses and forcing thousands of residents to be evacuated. Footage showed today that strong floodwater currents inundating villages and crop fields as rescue personnel were seen evacuating stranded residents with boats and front loaders. As of today, at least nine people have died in Guangdong province's city of Meizhou and another six were missing there amid the worst floods on record on the Songyang and Shiku rivers. Meanwhile, in the southern part of the country, weeks of scarce rainfall and sweltering heat have brought drought to several Chinese provinces, including Shandong, a major agricultural centre. Multiple farmers said the unreasonably early drought may cause extensive crop damage. The provincial capital of Jinan issued its highest heat alert in early June 2024 as temperatures looked set to break historical records for the month. President Xi Jinping called for all-out efforts to respond to the drought in the northern provinces as well as severe floods in the nation's south. The Philippines has accused China's Coast Guard of launching a brutal assault with bladed weapons during a South China Sea clash earlier this week, a major escalation in a festering dispute that threatens to drag the United States into another global conflict. Footage released by the Philippine military yesterday showed Chinese Coast Guard officers brandishing an axe and other bladed or pointed tools at the Filipino soldiers. Tension between China and the Philippines reaching a boiling point in the disputed South China Sea. New video released by the armed forces of the Philippines shows Chinese vessels surrounding a Filipino naval fleet tying up their boats and ramming into them with sirens blaring. The Chinese crew allegedly deploying tear gas and seen brandishing weapons. And in a shocking moment, one Chinese officer begins slashing one of the Philippines' inflatable boats with what appears to be a pickaxe. The video showing at least one Filipino officer being treated for injuries. Philippine officials say two of their rubber boats were seized and slammed the incident as a brazen act of aggression, saying, only pirates do this. However, China claiming a Philippine vessel dangerously approached one of their boats and defended their officers' actions, calling them, quote, legitimate, reasonable, professional and restrained. It's just the latest clash between the two countries in the critical waterway. In March, drone video capturing the moment multiple Chinese Coast Guard ships blast water cannons at a small Filipino vessel, creating serious damage, according to their armed forces. China has long tried to claim sovereignty over most of the South China Sea, angering many of its neighbors in the region. After this week's incident, the United States reiterating their military support to the Philippines and other allies. The PRC vessel's dangerous and deliberate use of water cannons, ramming, blocking maneuvers and towing damaged Philippine vessels endangered the lives of Philippine service members. Uh, it's reckless and it threatens regional peace and stability. 
Time for a short commercial break. More world news coming on the other side. On the road to the White House tonight, financial disclosure showed yesterday that for the first time, Donald Trump's presidential campaign reported having more cash in his main account than President Biden's re-election campaign had in its account. This comes as both sides build their war chests ahead of the November 5th election. Donald Trump's presidential campaign and his Republican Party last month narrowed a gap in fundraising with President Joe Biden's own re-election effort. Financial disclosures to the Federal Election Commission on Thursday showed Trump had $116 million in the bank at the end of May, more than double what the campaign had a month earlier. Meanwhile, the Republican Party, which is raising money together with Trump, stood at $54 million in cash. Together, they're still roughly $40 million short of the $212 million war chest that Biden and the Democratic Party reported. However, that gap had narrowed by a third since April. That's because Trump's fundraising has surged since then, including during the weeks leading up to his conviction in late May over a hush money payment he made to a porn star. Both camps are also ramping up fundraising from billionaires who are allowed to give unlimited sums to groups allied to the campaigns known as super PACs. A separate filing on Thursday showed conservative billionaire Timothy Mellon gave $50 million last month to a pro-Trump super PAC known as MAGA Inc. On Biden's side, billionaire Mike Bloomberg has given nearly $20 million to two super PACs backing the president's re-election effort, according to sources familiar with the matter. Republican candidate Donald Trump has said he would automatically grant green cards to foreign graduates of U.S. colleges if re-elected. This is an unexpected turn from the Republican known for his tough rhetoric on immigration. During a podcast interview yesterday, Trump promised to make it easier to bring talent to the U.S. and said anyone who graduates from a U.S. college should be able to stay in the country. This proposal marks a significant shift from the restrictions he enacted during his presidency on immigration by higher skilled workers and students. The announcement also comes days after U.S. President Joe Biden unveiled plans for a large-scale immigration program that would provide a pathway to citizenship for immigrants married to American citizens. Trump stated that graduates from any college, including junior colleges, should receive green cards automatically upon graduation. He emphasized the need to retain talented individuals in the U.S. to support the economy and stated that graduates from a college should get a green card as part of their diploma to stay in the country, including those from junior colleges. Trump attributed his inability to implement this policy during his presidency to the need to solve the COVID problem. This proposal contrasts sharply with Trump's previous actions, such as the Buy American and Hire American executive order, which aimed to restrict business visas to the highest paid or most skilled applicants. Over to the United Kingdom now. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said he was incredibly angry to hear that three of his party colleagues were being investigated over allergy placing bets on an early announcement of the general election. On another chaotic day for the governing Conservatives, the party's campaign director took a leave of absence linked to an investigation around bets being placed on the timing of the vote before it was announced. Sunak expressed his anger upon learning the allegations, emphasizing the seriousness of the matter and the importance of thorough investigation. He stated that anyone who has broken the rules should face the full force of the law. Polls indicate Britain is on course to elect a centre-left Labour government led by Keir Starmer, ending 14 years of rule by the Conservatives. And some polls have suggested Sunak's party could be heading to a historic defeat. The allegations that a second Conservative candidate was being investigated by Britain's gambling regulator and may have attempted to profit from their political knowledge of the timing of the election is the latest setback in Sunak's faltering efforts to stay in Downing Street. Sunak said if anyone has been found to have broken the rules, they should face the full consequences of the law and would be booted out of the party. Neither Lee nor Sounders could be reached for comment and the gambling regulator did not name those it was investigating. Placing bets with insider knowledge is a crime. 
a campaign to elect the next governor of Tokyo, one of the world's most populous capitals, began yesterday, kicking off a race between the city's first female governor and a prominent female politician from Japan's opposition. The election in the capital home to 11% of Japan's population comes as Prime Minister Fumio Kishida faces record low approval ratings amid a persistent political kickback scandal, a rising cost of living and a historically weak year. To get us the latest news on this, we go to Adetherna World News Special Correspondent Rasit Chandradasa, joining us from Tokyo in Japan. Rasit. Hello. We bring you an election news today. The, to the eagerly expected Tokyo Metropolitan Government election is called on July 7th. So we will be having uh, one of the biggest uh, pre-parliamentary election this year on July 7th. And the current governor, Koike-san, is expected to get a tough fight by the opposition leader, Renbo. And so far, interestingly, we have 56 candidates who have declared their candidacy. And most of these candidates are either independents, and interestingly, there's a one party has fielded 30 candidates. So the Tokyo election is also a way to get your name popular, and people are maximizing in that. So most of the election, uh, happens during a two-week campaign which actually starting probably from this week or uh, early of the next week where both Koike san and Renu san expected to declare their manifesto and why this election is closely watched because of the big election that we expected to happen in October that is the diet election the election of the parliamentary and uh, it runs up to October and Prime Minister Kishida san has to uh, called a new election in October. So this Tokyo election, the government election, is a good indicator that who has the edge. Whether the present governor, Koike, she has the backing of the ruling LDP, or the opposition leader, Renho, she has the backing of the main opposition party, CDP. So everyone is expecting a tough battle, and we would know the results by the night of July 7th. Over to you. Thank you, and that was other than a World News Special Correspondent, Rasita Chandradasa, joining us from Tokyo in Japan. Hundreds of demonstrators marched through cities across Kenya on Thursday to protest against plans to raise $2.7 billion in additional taxes to reduce the budget deficit. Protesters say the tax rises will hurt the economy and raise the cost of living for Kenyans, who are already struggling to make ends meet. Demonstrators clashed with police in Kenya on Thursday as they protest against government plans to raise $2.7 billion in additional taxes to reduce the budget deficit. Riot police fired tear gas to disperse pockets of protesters in the capital Nairobi and blocked their path to parliament. Protesters say the tax rises will hurt the economy and raise the cost of living for Kenyans who are already struggling to make ends meet. The Kenyan parliamentary panel on Tuesday urged the government to scrap some new taxes proposed in its finance bill, including new ones on car ownership, bread, cooking oil and financial transactions. Demonstrators across Kenya called for lawmakers to drop the bill and wave placards with slogans like we say no to economic dictatorship. The International Monetary Fund has urged the government to increase revenues in its 2024-25 budget to reduce state borrowing. President William Ruto was elected almost two years ago on a platform to help Kenya's working poor, but has faced repeated anti-tax protests. He has defended the tax increases, saying the government need to reduce its reliance on borrowing. Time for a short commercial break. More world news coming on the other side. Welcome back. A dog owner in Ridoso, New Mexico, was compelled to evacuate her home this week due to the deadly South Fork wildfire. Days later, she was joyfully reunited with one of her beloved dogs, an eight-year-old pit bull. Dog owner Courtney Bell was forced to evacuate from her home in the village of Ruidoso, New Mexico this week and flee the deadly South Fork wildfire. She was only reunited with one of her dogs, this eight-year-old pit bull named Capone, days later. Bell had to leave him behind while driving with her three other pups and her daughter because Capone's anxiety sparked tension among the dogs and Bell feared a fight. 
which led to a gut-wrenching decision. All you're thinking is, I just left my dog, you know, like a dog that I love, like he's eight years old, you know, and I've, we've had him so long since he was young and he's part of our family. You leave a part of your family. Bell left water, a soaked rug, and a crate for Capone, hoping to return or that someone would rescue him. I had to make that tough choice to leave Capone at the house because you can't have a bloodbath in your front seat when you're trying to evacuate a fire, you know? Um, we weren't in immediate danger, so I tried to drive to see if they would be calmer going, and it was just getting worse, and I didn't want my daughter to be harmed, you know? So I had to make the choice to turn around and take him back to the house. At the Eastern New Mexico fairgrounds where many are sheltering, she posted about Capone on Facebook. A few days later, a couple found him and they were soon together again. They're just animals to love and to love you back. And if you're having a bad day, they're there and they're not going to sass you or, you know, <laughs> nag at you for being late. They're just happy to see you. And um, they're a loving distraction in a crisis. While Bell and her family have found safety at the fairgrounds, New Mexico's governor said Tuesday that 500 homes have been destroyed by the South Fork fire and two people had died. So far, Bell's home has been spared from the wildfires, but they have yet to be contained. And with that, we conclude our final bulletin for this week. We will see you again on Monday with the latest happenings across the globe. Until then, have a great weekend and good night.